turn of the century, I was working at Mattel Toys, like 2001, 2002, when I first started there. Uh-huh. And one of the, one of the older uh, dudes who lived out in Burbank comes into work one day and he goes, you, you're a cartoonist, right? And I go, yeah. And he goes, you won't believe what I got this weekend at a garage sale. And I go, what? He goes, I got an original Disney animation desk for 150 bucks. Holy and yikes. For people that are in the know about those Disney animation desks, they almost have like this storied history. Yeah. Uh, they were this beautiful custom built animation desk that I think the first version Walt himself approved the design of. Anyway, they're amazing desks. And there was, uh, when Disney got rid of their animation building in Burbank uh, a decade or so ago, all of a sudden around Burbank, there was a flood of them like on the back loading docks of, of Disney and then they all sort of disappeared. Oh and there's various gosh. stories about where they went and what happened to them. And did they destroy them? Did they sell them? Anyway, this guy though, the dude that I worked with at Mattel, he was going just driving by a garage sale, pulled over, and the woman was a widower of not one of the original, uh, you know, the big, what are they called, the Magnificent Seven or whatever those those big animators were, but just a, an original Disney animator that when he left Disney, he got to keep his desk. Oh, my. And then when he passed, she kept it for a few years, and then at the garage sale, she's like, I don't need it. Well, I, let's say $150. Meanwhile, those desks, if you put them up on eBay, they go for like eight, nine thousand bucks. I've seen one in really good condition that went for ten thousand. Wow. And so so I, I tell you this whole entire story just to let you know that this is your nerd of a friend. Every time I go to anything in Burbank, an event, uh, uh, a, a meetup, a lunch, a dinner, I, I I will be honest that I drive up and down maybe one or two more streets than I yeah. need to, just because I'm like Dear God, let me pass by a garage sale that has a Disney animation desk. That's all I want. I just want a, a sweet... It's become your white whale. It, <laughs> my Burbank <laughs> white whale, yeah. I just, I want one of those sweet, sweet desks. I want oh. it so bad. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about your friend from Mattel? How old is he? Oh, Bradley, wait a minute. So you're saying if I murder him, I'm, if I'm I push saying, him down... To- no, well, no, ingratiate. I'm, I'm saying ingratiate yourself. But, you know, maybe maybe th- every now and again, take him out for... Uh, fr- something, some, some fried foods. Maybe ply them with some beer. You know, okay, clog those arteries up and build friendship at the same time. And then when he kicks, maybe you're in the will. You know what, Brad? Yeah. There are worse plans in the world. You- so you're just saying I need to be a nice person. Hmm. Yeah. I- this is a hard plan. All well, right. Well, uh- if you if you call <laughs> intentionally clogging his arteries in the aim of trying to induce a cardiac arrest, nice. Then yeah, you're sweet as hell. <laughs> but I'm seriously, have you have you thought about keeping in touch with this guy? Well, as is true with every social situation in my life, it's out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> and so as soon as I left Mattel, I was like, bye, 10 year friendships. I'll see you all if I ever see you again. Uh, you keep in touch with nobody? Uh, maybe one or two people I keep yeah. up with. But uh, for the most part. It, it, it being L.A., uh, it's <laughs> if you have to drive anything over 15 minutes, it's friends you never see again. You're like, bye, <laughs> have a great life. Yeah, we're 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 done here. I'll I'll, I'll be uh, looking at your posts on Facebook from time to time. Aside from that, yeah. congratulations on your marriage. Congratulations on your divorce. Bye. You know, like that's the only time you chime in. Uh, anyway, so uh, so if you if you live in Burbank. And you see Dave Kellett driving up and down uh, uh, the streets of Burbank. Now you know why I'm why I'm rolling the roads, I'm looking for that sweet sweet animation desk for 150 bucks. Oh, from a kind old widower. Yeah, miracles can happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, me being married at all is, is proof of that, Brad. So that's <laughs> yes, that's it true. is. Yes, it is. Well, on that note, friends, let's say a big hello and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of webcomics.com and cartoonist of Evil Inc. And I'm Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. Whoa. Yeah. And Brad, I got to ask you, uh, because I didn't notice it until I listened to you right there. It sounds like you got a little sniffle in your snuffle. Is your, is your... <laughs> yeah, I have not started a uh, two-pack-a-day habit. Uh, there, there's been a little summer cold that has been steadily making it through each one of the family members, and I'm the uh, penultimate one uh, to get it. Uh, the, my wife is the last person standing. Well, now we know who is the healthiest in the house, <laughs> yes. and it's not Brad Geiger. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sorry that you're not feeling great, but you, your your optimism and cheerfulness is still here. That's good. That's a good uh, sign. That's right. Still standing. Still standing. And, and really, it's just a little congestion. I don't feel bad. It's just I'm a little, little uh, wheezy. Well, uh, on on the note of your voice, I actually have some fun news that I want to share with everybody uh, uh, yeah. for the show. So, if you guys remember when we did a, a little push in the in the past, where we were trying to get five star reviews on iTunes, thinking eh, maybe that might help uh, get the word out about the show, uh, we got to the five oh, the five star ratings that we wanted, which I think was a hundred to hundred and fifty. I don't remember what it was now. And uh, so we did a show I called. I think it was an even hundred. Uh, was it even hundred? Is that what it was? Okay, we did a show called yeah. Drunk Comic yeah. Lab. Uh, and we have a new fun thought that we would like to get to. We are now hovering about 200 patrons on Patreon. And uh, we had the fun idea that f- once we reach 250 of you joining us on Patreon, we are going to do a video version of Comic Lab where Brad and I will sit uh, mics and headphones on, but with with cameras. Uh, we're, uh, the logistics are still to be worked out, but uh, we're yeah. we're tech savvy enough. We can figure this out. These two old men, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think it'd be super fun. It'd be it'd be fun to to see uh, Brad's noggin as he makes you smile. That's uh, I gotta tell you, there are worse things. There are worse things. <laughs> well, not only that. Sometimes we talk about things on the show that's a little bit visual. And it would be nice to do a version of the show every once in a while. We're still this is still going to be a podcast, but to have something that we would put up as a Patreon exclusive, where we can maybe do a tutorial type thing, or just kind of show you what we're talking about uh, instead of trying to explain it. Uh, a video version of the show uh, as a uh, intermittent thing wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. And maybe a little something extra for everybody—a little pan, camera pan down Brad's calves. That's—I mean—that's something the whole world Yo, wants to see. That's—I'm—I'm I'm telling you, if I had a good feature, I think it'd have to be my. I, calves. I would say it's your calves. I, I yeah, it's, yeah. I've—I've I've got amazingly well de- defined calves. Yeah, you could, you can, you can cut a a, a full block of cheese with those calves. That's amazing. <laughs> Cut a full block of cheese. What a weird I phrase that is. Why cut, did I go with that? Yeah, there you go again. I did not cut the cheese for the last time. <laughs> <laughs> I like it when my brain offers up the weirdest possible version of a, of a like, a, yeah. cut a full block of cheese. Where did that come from in my brain? Um, <laughs> anyway, so Brad, the thing that I want to talk to you about this week, because I think this is fun. We've been talking a yeah. lot about business. We've been talking a lot about Patreon, but I wanted to talk with you about some cartooning basics because you had a fun uh topic that came up um the other day in your reading where uh and you want to explain it to me about about exclamation yeah. points in lettering this is something that i was surprised to find out was actually a heated discussion a heated debate in lettering circles uh, for, uh, among comics letters should you have an exclamation point with a sound effect and I just I know what I think, uh, and I just wanted to hear uh, what what your opinion is. Okay, so before you tell me anything about who and what we're making this argument online, you just want my straight up opinion. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and 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 I like I'm not going to say if you say a certain way, I'm gonna I'm not going to say. Well, Nate Picos disagrees with you. I I I don't know where certain letterers fall. All I know is that uh, it it is a heated debate, and and I guess I should also an- a- a- add that we're talking about like a loud sound effect, not like a kitchen sink dripping, although that you could also make the argument one way or the other, but like a kablam or a kapow. Right. A single word, Colossus punching uh, uh, the blob or something, right? You want you want a, a yeah, full exactly. A yeah, I gotcha. That's more of a Cthulhu, but but go ahead. Wait, yeah. no, hold on. P- Colossus metal hitting the blob, an immovable object. You you need you need a, a more duller sound. It's not going to be bam. That's a that's a sharp sound. Blob is is soft. That's going to be a oom oom kathoom. That's 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 that, that's textbook uh, sound effect. I boy, your onomatopoeia is off point, my friend. This is not. <laughs> you are not thinking through the parameters of what. What what sound effect do you think it well, is? Well, the whole point of the blob's powers is he changes his molecular structure, doesn't he, so that he can become an immovable object? He can become super dense? Isn't that the whole thing with the blob? I don't know. If, I, I always thought he, like, extended a force field under under the ground that rooted him to that place. What? Well, boy, we have not know. We do not know what the blob can do. <laughs> <laughs> Two dudes that barely remember Marvel Comics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it, wow! Somebody, you got it. You got to agree with me at this point. He's it's it's a it's it's a more 
it's not a sharp sound effect. It's going to be a more rounded, dull sound yeah, effect. Yeah, okay, you know what? You have to match the visuals of the, that the reader is seeing, and he's a very fleshy dude, but I'm bump. And so yeah. uh, I think you're right that you would You know what? I'm going to go on record. Brad's right with Cthum. It's not, it's not, wouldn't have been my yeah. first choice, but it's in the wheelhouse of where you want to be. Anyway, have a good week, everybody. This has been Comic Lab, your show about making comics. <laughs> and making a living from comics. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to get the, the longest email about, actually, the blob as he was know, first invented in 1982 <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> the blob was, um, all right. So anyway, uh, well, do you, do you want do you want to circumvent it here? I've got the I've got the wiki up right now. I really thought you were going to say you, you, all... you want to you want you want to circumcise this. Uh, <laughs> you want to circumvent this. All right. Yes. Go ahead. He can alter his personal monodirectional gravity field beneath himself to make himself virtually immovable as long as he's in contact with the ground. Oh. I, the only reason I interrupted you is because it proved that I was right. Other than that, I, I, I want to let you keep going. Oh, my going. God, the smallness. The smallness of that is delightful. Oh, wow. Hold oh, on. how long have we been doing this show? You know how petty I am. I've got to have these little victories. I got nothing else in my life. I got to have this. You're like, you're like at home with a pipe. I need this. I need to win on the blob. I need a win. I need one in the W column for crying out loud. The science of this is ridiculous, though. His foot just needs to be touching the earth. Like, why would that affect how he affects his own gravity field? That if you're, if you're floating, if you're able to, oh, that makes me angry. Anyway, all right. <laughs> I can see though, you know what though, from a storytelling perspective, actually that's a great way to do it. Where if he's if you can lift yeah. him up off the ground, he's powerless. That's great. Then you got yeah, you've got at least some way of of getting around that. So what you need is Colossus to Cthum him up into the air and then before he can there and, you go. Yep. We did it, Brad. And then the question is, when he does Cthum him, exclamation point or no. Well, to me, okay, this is an interesting point. Uh there are sound effects words that are more requiring of an exclamation point. And Cthum ends with a closed mouth sound, oom. An, an oom to me is not a exclamation point word. A kang, where the lips are out and your cheeks pull back. A wham, where, you're, where your uh, chin drops and your lips pull back. That's an exclamation point word. Wait a minute. Wham, you end with a closed mouth. It's an M. Wham. Mm. Wham. Wham. Yeah, well, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow that, Counselor. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around this whole... I, 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 was, I, was, I was thinking three different uh, ways that you could approach this, and mouth position was not in the top ten. Oh, Brad, I'm always thinking uh, about mouth fast, position. You... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I should that I should have guessed. <laughs> but no <laughs> you, I, I, you go on with this. I'm fascinated by the Dave Kellett uh, uh, the the sounding out uh, uh, mouth position theory of exclamation well, points. Well, I okay, so I for of my 10 years at Mattel Toys, uh a good 6 and a half, 7 of them, I was a copywriter and uh I would have to name uh, all of Mattel's, not all of Mattel's toys, but a lot of them. And um, you might say to yourself, well, that's not a lot of toys, but Mattel has something on the order of uh, 2,000 trademarks. It's a ridiculous number of trademarks. It's almost, I think it's either the yeah. highest or the second highest number of trademark filings in the US. And so we were constantly coming up with names, right? Little Boopsy, Diggle Wiggles, <laughs> all this sort of stuff, right? All, you know, uh, What was your favorite toy that you named? Oh God, I don't know. You're putting me on the spot there. Oh. But anyway, I want to get back to the point about naming. Okay. To me, one of the one of the strongest things you could do in a name is when you could end a name in a smile. And it's not <laughs> an accident. It's not an accident when you go through a lot of toys that they all end in smiles for little kids. And that would so be have, something with an E on the end, right? Like, right. So you have Barbie, yeah. Polly, um, uh, Hot Wheels. Um uh, I'm trying to think of all the other ones. I, I'd made a whole list of them, and so many of them end in a smile. And I was like, this can't be accidental from a copywriting standpoint that there is a super subconscious thing about a name, a really resonant name for kids that ends in a smile. Wow. Um, and, and if you look at, like, from a naming structure standpoint, whenever J.R.R. Tolkien would name something, his words, and it was something, an evil force, whether it was Morgoth or Sauron or Saruman, it was a chewy word that was uncomfortable to say. Yeah. Um, 
uh, like Gondor is a is a name that that uh, is uh, you know strength Gondor two easily syllable uh, you know strong syllable uh, combinations. The Shire is almost ends with a with a, a lyrical uh, you know wispiness. Yeah. But if you look at all the names that are the evil forces of uh, of Tolkien's work, they're uncomfortable. They're almost Germanic sounding uncomfortable names to say. A lot of ths, a lot of gs, a lot yeah. of heavy rs. You know. Um, I, boy, we went down a rat hole as far as naming. Um, but it, anyway, yeah. Oh, I'm fascinated. Yeah. So for me, lettering is uh, the the exclamation point is well. Let's get into a bigger topic of why an exclamation point is helpful. To me, lettering and specifically sound effects are like a third uh, uh, piece of the puzzle working for you to create a mood, a tone, a style of a comic. Wouldn't you yes, say? Absolutely. Like, you have the you have the characters and the character design and the look of them. They immediately communicate the strongest point about what you're about to read, and then the text and the word choice and the diction all uh, contribute to the overall tonality of the strip, or or comic. And then a really big and frankly an unsung hero of comics is the lettering, both in terms of body text and sound effects or special yes. effects words. Yes. Um, and so for me, the choice about whether to do a um an exclamation point or not with a sound effects lettering is entirely subjective into the mood that you're trying to create so if you have a thunk that you want to put a a a, a bullet on is like this is the end of that fight scene then yeah. the thunk has a period on it not an exclamation point you know that kind of thing i would grant you that yeah and if 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 it's if it's a turning point in a fight where our hero who has had three pages of being um just gotten the shit kicked out of him if uh, if he or she suddenly turns around on page four and it's the first successful hit that they've landed, that wham, you might want to put an exclamation point on there because you're excited that it's that it's happening, you know. Uh huh. So for me, for me, it's both um, uh, a sound of how it how does it feel in terms of how a reader will sound it out in their mind, and also the look and feel and tone of that that story needs at that moment. So now I've talked too long. What do you think about an exclamation point? <laughs> well, you know me. I'm a rule of thumb guy, and I, I like rules of thumb it, with the understanding that it it it's, it's can be broken under certain circumstances. And that being said, I probably come a lot closer to agreeing with you than disagreeing. My overall rule of thumb is that sound effects should not have uh, a a exclamation point or or any kind of uh, punctuation because their whole nature, the fact that you're making them big, you're making them in this display font, you're making them expressive. That is an exclamation point of its own. When I, when I all of a sudden use this big jagged font that floats above and it's outlined and reversed out and all this other stuff, uh, to add an exclamation point to all of that is redundant. That being said, I do agree with what you're saying is that sometimes a punctuation mark can be emotional. In other words, you had the perfect example, a thunk that ends a scene like the, like the hero falls after being, uh, uh, you know, knocked out and his body hits the floor and it's the end of act one, right? Thunk period right. that I get. And, and an excite, like, for example, it might be I, an ironic punctuation mark. Uh, the guy is trying to fix his sink because it's dripping and drip, 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 no punctuation mark, drip, 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 no punctuation mark. He fixes the sink. He goes to bed. He's got the red eyes. He's got to be up in the morning. We've all seen these. Uh, you know, you know, this is, I think I'm doing a Daffy Duck uh, animated short uh, verbatim. But anyway, he finally gets to bed and all of a sudden the sink starts dripping. That first drip might have an emotional exclamation point to it not a functional one, but like, right. here we go again. So I, my, in my head, uh, exclamation points and other forms of uh, punctuation do not belong in sound effects unless there's an emotional reason. Cause there is no grammatical reason to do it uh, because all of that uh, display visual that you're putting into typography uh, makes an actual exclamation point redundant. I okay yes I I will I will uh I will say that between the two of us um all of those considerations are a, a viable way to figuring out with your lettering the, the <laughs> critical question of whether or not you need a uh a, so now tell me now that we've that, now that we've both put our our opinions forward what yeah. was the consensus among the greats that you were following that were fighting over it 
all I, I I don't have any more to add to that other than to say that it was something that I never even considered was a was a so much as a question, and I found out through just seeing a, a couple of random tweets that it was a much bigger debate than I had given it credit for. But I don't know like what the consensus is. We we might put a poll up in, on the uh, Comic Lab Patreon page to see what our followers think. But uh, but I I don't know what consensus is. No. Well, I another way to look at this is that you know, let's look at it like a keyboard. All those keys, all those marks, all those uh, all those all those uh, uh, iconographic letters and numbers and and dashes, they all have a use. So if you, in a way, as a cartoonist, are telling yourself uh, uh, akin to a pianist who says, "I can use all these keys except for the F sharp," um, <laughs> it feels like. I mean, why why limit yourself? If you're the mood of your comic calls for that exclamation point in your lettering, then then the, I I I'm more apt to just say, "Go for it." It's uh, Follow your heart. What what does your heart tell you, Brad? That's so what I say. There is a podcast called Hidden Brain, and okay. it's it's a wonderful podcast. It's an NPR podcast, and they talk about uh, this song and this particular recording, which uh, a jazz pianist made. And the funny story about it is that just before this recording was to be made, uh, the jazz pianist uh, refused to come out on stage. Because he didn't, it was a, he had done the show for less money than he usually does it. If I, if I remember the story right, he was kind of doing this as a favor. And this person who was putting the event together was kind of a first timer at this. And this person did not have the piano uh, uh, properly set up. In fact, the piano was in such bad shape. There was a, a several keys that did not work. And yet People were sitting in the audience to see this person perform, and they were going to do a recording. So he had to go out and perform against his better judgment. This, this person begged him, begged him not to, not to storm away. And he went out and he performed this jazz performance where in which he had to avoid certain use of the pedals that didn't work. He had to avoid certain keys that would not strike. And there, there was a number of other technical problems that he had to uh, overcome. And he did this l- lyrical, moving, amazing performance that has gone down as, if I, again, if I'm telling the story correctly, one of the best, most requested, most loved jazz recordings ever. And it was all because he was limiting himself he couldn't he couldn't allow himself to play the full piano. He was limiting himself to just the certain keys and it forced him to improvise. It forced him to do things. It, he, it forced him to use his full powers as a jazz musician uh, at their absolute height. And it got one of the best jazz recordings ever out of it. And so when I hear you say that, I, I want to remind you that purposefully limiting yourself sometimes is a way of forcing ourselves to bring our other powers to the forefront. I And, and just to remind everyone at home, uh, this week, we forgot to mention it up front, but this week is Brad beating the shit out of all Dave's opinions. So that's what... Dave, I every forgot. week is that week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, hey, Brad, I think the sky is blue. Dave, I'm so sorry you're full of shit on this one. Hey Brad, I'm feeling I'm feeling like I'm in a good mood. Well, you shouldn't be, well, jerk. You shouldn't. You don't even know how to tie your shoes. Look what you did there. I'm getting you Velcro. So, all right, I'm gonna I'm not gonna pirouette on my opinion, but I will say this: there have been times. Uh, I'm not comparing myself to this jazz musician, but I'm sure you can relate to this. There have been times where with Sheldon, I still draw with ink and pen and, and yeah. brush and and pencil and paper and eraser. Um, there have been times where. I didn't have, because I was on the road or something was wrong, I didn't have one or two key parts of what is normally a well-oiled machine of how I create a Sheldon. Uh And I had to, on the fly, reinvent how I was going to draw this. In fact, I I can think of some specifics where I didn't have a pencil. And I'm very strong in my pre-sketching with Sheldon, right? I Uh didn't have a pencil. And so I had to figure out how to do it. And what I ended up doing was literally scratching the page with a key, I think. To give myself um, marks on the page that obviously wouldn't be scanned, but that I could see, I used a car key just from my pocket and and basically sketched out the comic with a key on the paper as a mark making. And 
all of this is to say that like that jazz musician, I looked at it at the end and it was like, this is actually a really great, like, I like the way that I did this and it required <laughs> yeah. me, I had to jump through more hoops, but in a way my mind was more focused, if you know what I mean, yep. because I, I couldn't passively draw it. I had to actively draw it. Um, and I couldn't just put myself in third gear. I had to constantly be dancing into how I was going to create this comic because it was it was so new and different and fresh that I had to engage my creativity as I was doing it in a way that I don't normally do. So yeah. I agree with you that 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 jazz improvisational story sounds very real to me because I know in my own experience that that's happened a couple different times in my career when I didn't have the right equipment to do what I needed to do. Yeah. So as we're learning, uh, as we're learning this week, uh, I'm wrong in all instances and Brad is right once again. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to get that needle pointed and, uh, and send it over to you on a pillow. <laughs> oh, oh, great. Thank you. And the, the needle point, the needle point is just going to say, Dave, everything in your life is a sham, including your marriage. And I'm just going to be like, thanks, Brad. Dave, don't piss me off. This is just proof that I can stab things 2000 times and not get tired. <laughs> uh, so one one little pro tip i want to share about uh, sound effects because i i'm actually a little fascinated by this uh, a couple things i want to talk about pro tips number one uh, if you're doing digital lettering go out and buy a few <laughs> digital fonts that are specifically set up to be sound effects comic craft has some great ones blambot has some great ones and i'm going to remind you again don't forget comic craft has that sale on january 1st every year where even their most expensive two three hundred dollar fonts are based uh, they're they're priced based on the year. So January first of this year, every font was twenty dollars and eighteen cents, and next year on January first, uh, every one of their fonts will be twenty dollars and nineteen cents a piece. I always load up on sound effect fonts uh, on January first uh, from Comic Craft because they've got some great ones, and also. Don't use it in a straight rectangle. Don't use it straight out of the box. Take that sucker into Photoshop and give it a little text arc. Give it a little bend. Make it wrap a little bit. Now, there's nothing more uh, amateur than a sound effect that exists on a straight horizontal baseline. Give that sound effect some character. Make it leap off the page. It should be something more than just a straight piece of letters on paper or letters on pixel on, on a screen, it should have its own bounce. It should have its own personality. And finally, if you're ever wanting to challenge yourself uh, to, to, to go beyond the sound effects that Dave and I talked about, the Kerthoom and the Kabam and all that stuff, uh, for you younger people, check out this guy. And Dave knows exactly who I'm going to say. In fact, you just fill it in. Used to work for Mad Magazine. He's the king of onomatopoeia. This guy, the, the very use of onomatopoeia became uh, uh, a central point in his work. And his name is... as I love it when you do this to me. His name is Skippy McDoodle. <laughs> you don't... Don Martin. Are you serious? Oh, Don, Don Martin. It came tripping into my tongue. No, I was just pretending that I didn't know Don Martin was who you're talking Don, about. go and look up. And, and that's another one. You can always find some of his little trade uh, paperbacks that Mad Magazine used to put out. You can find them at flea markets all over the world. Uh, this guy did, on, he, he did kathwap, kathwing, kasquish. He, he, he made up onomatopoeia that was so characteristic that at this point, if you use a Don Martin uh, sound effect, people will call you on it because it was so closely related to him. So uh, another good indication to you that maybe going beyond and, and kind of like what Dave did, may, 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 thinking about the psychology of, of the sounds of words, uh, go beyond biff, bang, and pow, and, and see what you can do to come up with some really characteristic sound effects. Yeah, and and, and uh, since I'm excited by what Brad's onto there, I will say feel the word, like feel it. There's a reason yeah. why fonts are designed a certain way. If you have the word squish, feel how squish feels when you draw that word. Yeah. And and remember that that word is in that moment in that panel. It's a character. It has purpose and need, and and uh, and it does a, a very big job. So spend as much time as on a, as you would on that word as you would as on a character. Um, yeah. The payoff is tremendous. And and look at your best and favorite uh, childhood comics from DC or Marvel or Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin and Hobbes is great, by the way, for certain uh, sound effects words. Um, because it's also, it's a stylistic choice. That that word, if you think of a Calvin and Hobbes word 
Brad, in mm-hmm. the back of your mind right now, if you think of like a stone, if Calvin throwing a stone into water and you're hearing a bloop, you can picture exactly how Watterson would have done that. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I would encourage you, I know Brad was talking about using your digital fonts. I would encourage you to um, spend six months, 12 months in the background of your comics and try to do it by hand yeah. because it's it's really instructive. It will only make you a better cartoonist overall. And your ability to handle letters um even if you end up going digitally, it will translate digitally uh, the the skill and the time that you've put into doing it analog. So I would I, I I understand that a lot of people will do it digitally. That's fine. I do it sometimes too, but take the time to try to do it by hand. The payoff can be tremendous. So I agree. That's our that's our capstone on that one, Brad. So Brad, what do you want to jump to next? We've done some lettering. Uh, we talked about how lettering should be like a mood. We talked about we've, we settled the issue that Brad, I guess, is right about exclamation <laughs> points with lettering. <laughs> well, in that case, let's do this. I want to talk about collaboration. It's something that I've really gotten kind of fascinated with. And what I think we need to start doing, especially for the younger web cartoonists, people who are just starting out, Uh, I think we need to encourage more collaboration. I'm seeing a lot of comics that are drawn really well, and particularly humor comics, that really struggle with humor writing. And and, and I wonder if maybe we don't need to encourage people who are good at the art, not so good at the writing, to collaborate more. And I'm wondering, do do you think that that is a valid pursuit in other words is cartooning really such a uh, uh solitary uh, uh device that that it it precludes uh this kind of idea of collaboration or is it just that we haven't pushed the idea and promoted the idea enough well okay for this this entire topic is fascinating so yeah. i'm super excited to talk about this with you <laughs> i think a, i think a couple things i think um part of it is based on the heroes that we grew up with that's one Part of it is the way that American and Canadian and English speaking cartoonists are socialized in our culture. That's two. Mm-hmm. And the third one is um, a lack of exposure to the way that, say, the Japanese do things, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and so let's start with the first one. All of our heroes, regardless of who you are, your early childhood heroes were Watterson, were Larson, were Breathed, were Jim Davis, was, and then the big one, Schultz. Yeah. And all of them, aside from maybe Davis, uh, although you saw as a kid, you saw his name everywhere. So you assumed it was him doing it solo. All of them were very famous for doing it solo. Like that right. was the American Canadian tradition. Like if you were going to be a cartoonist, a comic strip cartoonist or an editorial cartoonist or a panelist, um, you did it by yourself. You were the jack of all trades and you were it was an amazing business and biggity bam, biggity boom. Right. And right. so we grew up with that. Whereas I think the Japanese, uh, well, I'm jumping ahead here, but the Japanese grew up in a system where you knew that even if your heroes were were famous for their individual titles, you knew they had three, four, five, sometimes 10 people working with them, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other one that I would say is, the, this is my middle point, was the, is the, the way uh, English-speaking um, cartoonists are viewed in their culture. We are brought up to think that a cartoonist has to be a little uh, socially insecure, a little yeah. bit fly solo, uh, that a cartoonist can't also enjoy playing volleyball with a team all the time or doesn't go to the gym. Like I, whenever I see Tom Richmond of Mad Magazine, who's super <laughs> buff if you don't know yeah. Tom Richmond, yeah. I it always stands out to me because it's always like, isn't that interesting that even, even in my own mind, I think of a cartoonist a certain way and Tom Richmond doesn't fit that mold, you know? Right, right. Um, because Tom can probably bench press me plus an extra, you know, a couple of small kids on top of me. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, anyway, long story short, I think there's something about the way that American comics have been for the last 50 to maybe even the last 100 years, mm-hmm. where even if someone had an assistant, it was almost uh, or or collaborated as a better way to say it, yeah. uh, regardless of what level of collaboration, they always hit it because something about American Canadian comics you were supposed to hide it. You were supposed to be doing this solo. It was a weird cultural thing. Um, now you tell me, what do you think uh, we don't have more collaboration? We don't have more I, people working together. I, I think it's a combination of things. I, th- I think, number one, you're absolutely right in everything that you said. Yep, uh, great. I, yes, finally. Oh, <laughs> oh, I've been waiting all show for this. 
<laughs> yes, I want everyone to know. I want everyone to know that I have a big chalkboard next to me in the in the recording booth here, and you... there's there's seven chit marks for Brad and one for me. <laughs> you move one of your little magnets across. <laughs> <laughs> and with well... that cutting comment, I move the magnet back. <laughs> no, I, uh, I I I I think that you're absolutely right, and, and I think what that tells us is that we need to, especially as people who are talking about web comics, right? We got to assume that a certain amount of people listening to us are kind of starting out or or in the intermediate phases, and they're feeling those growing pains. Uh, and I'm talking to you then because you are the person that I need to reach and say that it's okay to collaborate. In fact, if you are, if you're somebody who's, you can tell the art of your comic is good, but when you post it, you just are not getting the traction that you think you should be. Chances are the writing is weak. That's, that's usually the case is that it's the writing. You can have a well-drawn comic and the writing stinks and that comic's going nowhere. And, and the other side of it is you can have a pretty poorly drawn comic. And if the writing is fantastic, that comic is, is going to succeed. So if, if you're, if you can look at your comic and see that it's, it's clearly not the art, uh, then it must be the writing. Uh, and, and don't, don't, don't let yourself get caught up into this whole thing. Well, it's not as easy now as it used to be. Social media is too much so, uh, signal to noise. All that stuff is excuses. There might be a, a grain of truth to some of it, uh, but it's all excuses that's keeping you away from solving the real problems. So don't get caught up in that. It, 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 one thing, that, and, and this is one of the recurring themes of this show, is that it's all about the quality of your comic. That, that, that is the penultimate, uh, the number one thing is, is it's all about the quality. So that being the case... I thought, I thought it was all about that base. About that it, base. It is. No trouble. It is. <laughs> I thought it was my milkshake brings all the boys to the yard. Oh, my milkshake <laughs> brings all the boys to the yard. Can I tell you, one of the things that drives my wife nuts is that I will walk around the house singing a cappella. <laughs> my milkshake brings all the boys to the yard and their life is better than yours. You do, it, you do it like the Pirates of Penzance? Yeah. And, and, and Gloria is like, just stop what you're doing and take a look at what your life is. It's his exact moment. <laughs> Like, I'll be working in the yard, and I'll realize that a neighbor is looking at me, and I'm realizing that I'm singing, My milkshake brings all the boys to the yard. That, I want. now that's a Patreon exclusive right there. <laughs> that's a milkshake that brings no one to the yard. That's right, that's, that's that right. But listen, I think we need to start talking about collaboration. I think we need to start encouraging it more. And if you do fall into this zone where it's like, you know it's not the art, uh, and that tells you it must be the writing. And let's face it, let, go back and read some of your old stuff once it's not fresh in your mind anymore. And you'll you'll see that maybe what I'm saying has a little bit of truth to it. Uh, it the next question becomes, where do you find a collaborator? Well, this is this is hard. That's yeah. a hard question. Yeah, because it's easy to sit here and say, well, you, you guys need to be collaborating more. Uh, where, where the heck do they find? I've got some thoughts, but I want to hear where, if you if, if all of a sudden you were uh, I waved a magic wand and your writing wasn't hitting. Uh, where would the first, where would you start to look for collaborators? Okay, so in a way, what you're saying to people is it's like it's like taking your teen kids by the shoulders and saying, "Hey, you need to have friends. You need to have more friends." <laughs> and then, the, so then the follow up advice is, "Go get some friends." And you're yeah, and like, yeah. "Okay, thanks, Dad. Yeah. Great. I need to get friends." Uh, no, but where to find collaboration? So my advice is that there are times in your life where you can do manageably sized projects. I wouldn't just jump in with somebody on a 400 page book if you've never worked with them before right. or work on a project that you know is going to take a year and a half. Say like, hey, I, you know, I've, I've been reading your stuff online. Your, your tweets are really funny and your blog posts are really funny. Would you ever want to write a comic? And if so, let's just try a five page comic together and see what we can do. Yeah. Or alternately, if you know your writing is stronger than your, your drawing, there are people all over uh, uh, <laughs> DeviantArt or Instagram or Twitter that are posting amazing stuff. And you're like, they got the makings of a real good cartoonist here. Uh, hey, I, what if I wrote you a five-page script? Would you be willing to try and collaborate on it? Yeah. Um, and I think that's the way I would approach it is manageable size chunks. Um, what are your thoughts? How would you, how would you advise uh, someone? 
so recently my son, my older son, uh, started, started high school and it's a, it's a really wonderful high school, but it's project based. In other words, they, they're not about the midterm exam and the, and the final exam and stuff like that. They get graded throughout the semester on projects. So if you're learning biochemistry, uh, by the end of the, of the semester, you, you, you do a, a project that's biochem based that shows that you have learned the stuff that's along the way, right? Fun. Learn the yeah, stuff during right. the, it's neat. Uh, but of course, uh, step, you know what the number one problem of project based learning, you, gr- you, you group up, you've got three or four people working on a project and you know what happens every time a group works on a project, uh. you've got, yeah, right. <laughs> you've got one person that puts in all the work, one person that puts in none of the work and two people that coast and, and create more problems than they solve along the way. And this is what, and th- in his freshman year, uh. we found that to be the case on a couple where, where, uh, uh, you know, there was, a, there, there was one or two kids that were coasting and, and my son had to kind of deal with, Oh, it, this kid didn't turn in his part of the project and it's due today. And we get graded as a group, what happens, blah, blah. So of course we sit down with the teachers during parent teacher conferences and we express our concerns. And this is something that of course, being a project-based high school, they hear from every parent. It's like they bring out the sheet and start reading down it. Uh, but what they said really, really resonated with me. Okay. They go, it's okay. She said, they go, as far as you know, his grades, we know who's doing the work and who's not. And we find ways to make everything reflect the actual work. But here's the thing that was interesting. She goes, these kids are going to be going to high school together for four years. And what's going to happen very quickly is once a kid doesn't pull his or her own weight, they get a reputation. And the kids that work hard on projects are going to start grouping together and not getting those kids into their groups, not letting those coasters into the group. And through just evolution, uh, the, the, the kids that work hard are going to start buddying up. The middlers are going to start uh, buddying up. And the people who don't put a lot of work in are all going to be left to group with each other. And that is exactly how I foresee these collaborations going. In other words, it's, it's also another way of saying all that is you got to kiss a lot of frogs uh, before you get the prince or the princess <laughs> in the fairy tale. Uh, you're gonna, you, what, you're, in other words, do exactly what Dave is saying. Go through a number of mini collaborations with a number of people and see who the people are who can deliver. See who the people are that you work well with. See who the people are whose sense of humor or the sense of writing meshes with your own and do a bunch of these micro collaborations, maybe just one little piece, not even a four page, maybe just a panel, maybe a four panel. And the places to look for these, I've been thinking, are number one, Dave hit it right on the head, people with funny tweets. People who have, you can look through their Twitter feed and they are, that, that, that's the, the, especially if you're doing like panel work, uh, that's a, that's the place to find a single panel cartoonist uh, writer right there is somebody who can write a funny one tweet uh, piece. Yes. But also, also take a look at the memes and, and you've got to be careful, like uh, on a site like Imager, uh, uh, people posting original content memes, not necessarily uh, uh, reposted stuff, but stuff that, that they ha- uh, created original content. A meme is, is just another form of a cartoon, really. It, it's the same idea. It's an image plus words. Uh, that is where you find potential cartoon collaborators. And also there's places on Reddit where the focus is on humor writing and writing in general. And I think those are some places that you can do exactly what Dave is saying. Reach out and just talk about a micro collaboration. Hey, I'd like to, I'd like to do a couple of comics with you. What do you think? It, it might be kind of fun. And then if it starts to build and if you see that you work well with this person and st- something starts to build up, then maybe take it to the next level and say, hey, what do you think about doing this a uh, little bit regular? And, and then your next step, obviously, before you start working on the reg, is uh, get that contract. You know, you you gotta you gotta. Uh, as we said in a previous episode, you've got to start uh, uh, codifying expectations. What do you yeah. think about that? No, I think I think that's great. I think a couple things that popped into my mind. First of all, yeah. uh, you pronounced I M G U R as imager. Is that how you pronounce it? 
there's a big debate on the site. It, it's it's either Imgur or Imager, uh, and 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 that's another. Speaking of great debates, uh, that's one that uh, is 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 as common as the GIF GIF debate. Uh, what a shit name is this, the short version of that yeah, when yeah. when you have entire people not knowing how to pronounce it. So uh, <laughs> that's a short have version. Have you ever been on that site? Yeah, uh, I want to say didn't. Yes, for a while there, that was the Reddit. That was the way to upload co- comics to Reddit, wasn't it? You had to yeah. use Im- Imgur. I always pronounce it's, it as Imgur, but I mean, well, it could go either way. But if you're looking for social media for a particularly single panel comics, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it's very, very good. I had an intern working with me a couple summers ago from the University of the Arts, and she turned me on to it and, and very patiently walked me through <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, the, the philosophy of, of what tends to go there, you know, the community and so right, forth. Right, 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 right. And it is a really good place to post your cartoons just uh, and get a little bit of well, uh, know. track action and some following but anyway yes I, I, okay that, those are some places i think you could go yeah i, I so if that was <laughs> i don't know why that was my top of line question that i had to get answered <laughs> so you pronounce it imager so uh so that was one and then the other one is uh a i sympathize with your son because in high school i always oh. felt like uh i never got to pick my teams in high school yeah uh, and so i always felt like i got it, me as an a student got paired up with just stoner of the year and oh. it was like uh, hey, i can't do it today bro the surf's up to six feet no way i can't listen we're gonna have to work on that later brother i'm sorry about that man and i was like come on dude just two hours that's all we need uh so anyway you're getting a window into conscientious high schooler dave kellett there yeah uh, yeah uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, but I like that idea that that basically the quality will winnow to the top because it's not unlike what we advocate with comics, which is that you can't keep the good stuff down. So right. if you if you feel like you like your son on that team where he's complaining that he's doing the only good work, uh, he, over the course of his four years, you won't be able to keep him down. He'll find the good teams. He'll find success because uh, that has a way of winning itself out. And so I agree with their teacher about that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, as far as micro projects, I think that's the way to go. Uh, in, a, in a fun side note to that, um, uh, over the years, the last, I don't know, two, three years, uh, I've been hiring cartoonists and writers and illustrators to do short stories for Drive, my science fiction comic. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And I have to tell you, it's been a fun way to test out, totally not the way I intended it to be, but it's been a fun way to test out who I would like to work with again on something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can pull you aside after the show and be like, boy, this person was a train wreck. Oh, boy, or, oh boy this person never met a deadline that they couldn't break. Or, uh, or boy, this person really phoned it in. Um, and so, um, but then you also have, I've had four, five, six of them where it was just like, wow, they really rose to the occasion and they had fun with it. And the artwork was beautiful. The writing was beautiful. This is great. This is so creative. It added to the universe. It's amazing. Um, so I've been very happy with that as a process because it's a it's fun to open up your sandbox and let other people play in it and see what they'll do with it, and then b it's fun just to see what they bring with their skill set to these little mini projects and and how you might like to work with them again on the future for a bigger project. So um, I guess that's been my way of testing out collaboration uh, is a short version of it. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I like that idea. I think the micro collaboration is something, and 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 also it's it's low risk. Right. It's something that, that if it doesn't work out, you're not really out anything. It's, it's more like something that you do on a whim and, 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 and be prepared that some people just might not have time, might not, not want, might, might just think that you're kind of like, they might be standoffish because they're like, okay, what's this person's angle? You know, right. what are they really, how, up are, they, to? how are they playing me? What's going on? Yeah, here? yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but I, but, but here's, here's what I do want to hear from our listeners. I want to hear if you do try this. Tell us how it works out. Tell us, uh, uh, point us to some fruits of some of these micro collaborations, because I'm. I, it, it's something that I really want to address in the year and, and the next year to come, because uh, I think it's something that we uh, that that is uh, a deficit in web comics is the lack of collaboration. We've got a lot of people who are half of a of a good team that just hasn't been formed yet. And uh, I'd like to see I'd like to see if that's if that if this I'd like to see if the advice we give today is actually helpful. I, I love how every time you keep saying, uh, you know, about someone who just is half of a team and they don't know that their writing is soft, but their art is amazing. I keep feeling like you're subtweeting me every time you say this. Uh, like <laughs> I, Dave just needs to realize that Sheldon just needs a different oh, writer. It's God. what he needs. 
please listen, listen. I, being being totally honest, between the two of us, you are the better writer, without a doubt. You're you're definitely the better humor writer, with with without any uh, competition. Uh, and our art is so different that I I don't think that we can compare it. But y- you are a really really good humor writer. You can't well, even pretend about that. On that note, this is now the final episode of Comic Lab. I did this entire show just tears streaming down my cheeks. I just did this entire show just to get to that moment. The and answer now, was in you all along. It's like a it's like a ghost. It's like a ghost that's finally allowed to move on because they accomplished what they set out to do. You're like, just gonna hover in the background and disappear. I just I just like an angel. But Brad, I'm being called home now. I can I can go now. It's okay. It's okay to let go. You, this is all I needed. I'm floating up. Bye, Brad. Bye. Have a wonderful life. Oh, shucks. So yeah, I think I think we've pretty much done that topic in as you as you fade into the distance. And we've got time for one more topic. Do you have anything you'd that you'd like to talk about? <laughs> I like what? you said as you fade into the distance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have one that I would like to talk about. This one is one that um, I, it's been percolating in my mind for a while because it keeps happening with for me with Drive, and I want to talk to you about it because you have had a, probably a decade more experience writing long form comics or at least medium form comics with Evil Ink, mm-hmm. where stories that'll stretch uh, you know weeks at a time, if not years. So um, you'll know of what I speak. So here's my conundrum that I keep coming up with with Drive, and I wanted to ask you this specific question. So when you're writing for long form, what do you, Brad Geiger, do when you know what the next 20, 30, even 40 steps of your stories are going to be, right? For your story is going to be, yeah. but you don't know what the next immediate step is going to be, what this next page has to be. What do you do, Brad Geiger? Oh. Raconteur. I don't know where I, why I do that. <laughs> Man about town. Gadfly. Right. Um, I, 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 I've got a tried and true method that, that actually works uh, because, uh, and this is actually uh, more common than you think, because what happens is I think a lot of us write kind of an outline and we know where the overall story is going, but the individual steps uh, we don't have worked out yet. And I would even argue a lot of times the individual steps don't matter as long as they're interesting steps and they lead to the proper place. So uh, this happens to me quite a bit, uh, where I find myself like, okay, I know I got to get to this other place, and uh, but I don't know what my next step is. And uh, I, I try variations of this. I change the scene entirely. In other words, if 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 right now the wife has to have a talk with her husband because she found uh, a, a, a a a strange shoe behind the couch, right? And I know where this story's got to go, but I don't know the next step. Change the scene uh, from and 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 go completely away from where you think the next logical step should be. Okay. Maybe the next step is a woman who finds herself with only one shoe, right? Maybe we take it from that angle, right? <laughs> okay? okay? Or maybe we find where the other shoe is, but but the next step is not necessarily the woman confronts her husband. Maybe the next step is com- in a, in another town uh, or another situation uh, at, at, that leads back to that place. Uh, but what I usually find when I'm in that spot is that I'm too hardwired into A, B, C, D, E. And sometimes good storytelling is A, B, C, G, H, D. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you come to a fork in the road, you got to take it. Right. And sometimes what I, like, like it, it happened to me not so long ago where it, it, there was a conversation between characters. I knew where it had to go. And I was not getting anywhere. And a micro, uh, a micro step of this is just to change the first word balloon. Like a lot of time, the first in that dumb example I used, uh, the first word balloon is, "Hey, I found a shoe behind the couch." Maybe you change that first word balloon and maybe have the husband say the first thing. Maybe it's something small like that. Oh, just to prime the pump. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just instead of instead of trying it from where I logically think it's got to go, maybe starting from another angle. But like what I did not not so long ago is I had uh, a supervillain rampaging above the city. The superhero was rushing up to uh, in- intercede, and I I knew they had to collide, but I didn't know how. 
And what I ended up doing was changing the scene to a police officer sitting in his car, getting the call that there was a supervillain uh, on the loose. And that led to some very comedic moments where he tries to weasel out of it, right? And I, I was able to make an entire uh, 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 bridge from the uh, uh, these two are going to have a fight to those these two are in each other's face. I had an entire bridge that was very, very uh, uh, humorous, uh, very interesting, very uh, clever, I thought, uh, but it had nothing to do with superhero and villain. I changed the scene. All of a sudden, you're getting those plat points in the background as these cops and the dispatcher goes back and forth and the cops trying to get away from uh, it being assigned this job because the last person that went up against this fire starter supervillain, uh, his, his, uh, it, to, to quote the final punchline on the page, his ass looked like Burger King's by the end. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, uh, it, so, so yeah, change the scene. Uh, sometimes the whole reason you're having problems is that you're all, uh, uh, you're all focused on logic, A, B, C, D, and sometimes good storytelling doesn't go in a straight line. What do you think? Well, how do you address this? Well, this, I'm, I'm interested by, by your suggested route, because I'll tell you yeah. the way I approach writing drive and you can tell me uh your thoughts on this is that i try to maintain there's about four or five main storylines main plot points that are going that are humming along at any given point in drive right mm. and um uh what i try to do much like a punchline, uh you know you you build tension build tension like blowing up a balloon and then you pop it yeah but what i try to do with drive and i think i learned this from it was either tolkien or um or Sherlock Holmes, what I try to do is uh, right before you would pop it, you've been building tension, building tension, building tension, you switch storylines. <laughs> and then yeah! and then you build that next one up, build it up, build it up, build it up, build it up. And right before you would have some uh, celebratory moment or some big action moment or a big revelatory moment about someone's character, you bef right before you do that, you switch scenes, and people are like, "Oh God, I just I want to know what happens." What? <laughs> and so oh, for that's me, brilliant. For me, what that achieves is that it it's it's constant cliffhanger moments that are also very satisfactory when you jump back to them because people are like, "Oh yeah. right, I forgot about this. We were just yeah. about to find out what his brother's name was, or oh yeah, that's right. This is when the the gold gets revealed, or whatever you know, whatever it is." Um, and so. I'm interested that your idea for getting stuck on the next page is to switch storylines, basically, or to switch yeah. angles or to switch. Um, I hadn't thought of that is the genuine response. And I I want to percolate on that and think if that can help me through these moments with Drive. I think that's probably a good suggestion. If for no other reason than I have found it successful uh, to do in my writing where I'm building up tension. So maybe it's also good when I'm finding a moment where the story, at least for me, is at the skids, and I'm not sure which way to go next. Maybe I need to intentionally jump into a different storyline. Uh, uh, like, if I'm feeling it in the story, maybe the readers are too, so it's definitely oh, time to switch stories, you know? I was just going to say that it might be your subconscious telling you that it's time to switch the scene. Yeah, when, that's a good way to put it. I'm sorry, that was way too enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, that's great, yeah. Brad! Yeah. Suddenly, yeah. suddenly I become just... that guy that I was teamed up with in high school. Oh, brother, this is going to be a great <laughs> Jack, we're gonna have a great time. <laughs> I thought you turned into Billy Mays there for a minute. Yeah, this is the best shammy you're ever gonna have. <laughs> Billy Mays. Uh, wow, what a reference. <laughs> uh, that's great. But no, I think it might be your subconscious telling you that it's time to switch the scene. And 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 also just again, just realize that it, it is possible to get too wound up in a linear storytelling. Uh, it, 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 and 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 let's just put a pause on that just for a second. Nine chances out of ten, if you're starting a new comic, you're starting it in the wrong place. You're starting at the beginning. Nobody wants to start at the beginning. You start at the action. You start with something bizarre happening. How yes. does uh, how does a drive had a very good opening sequence? Right. It was that thing that goes through a, an asteroid that goes through the guy's head. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm, I. <laughs> I wanted, I, I wanted to make sure I was remembering it right. No, no, it was, yeah. I it wasn't was, being dismissive. You're, you're, okay. you're right, yeah. It was bizarre. It got my attention. It was weird, right? And it's like, what the heck am I in for? If you would have started uh, with, the, you know, in the beginning, uh, there was heaven and earth, and then the, the animals were created, and, and, and finally, there's a mobster in Chicago, 
uh, that, that's too long. That's that's we don't need all that backstory. The the first thing you got to do is get get in there, get an emotional hook, and get that reader interested. Then you can do the backstory. Can I use my literature majors for a minute, Brad? Please, please. So the thing that you were describing is called in medias res, and it's a Latin phrase from uh, the poet Horace. And what it means literally in translation is in the middle of things. You want to start yeah. in the middle of things because yeah. at the beginning of the story, someone is step, taking their first step out their door and uh, and is like, you know, they're, they're picking at their nose as they walk the first couple of miles. But if you start in medias res, in the middle of things, that adventurer is now fighting the dragon. It's two days later and he's at the cave and like no one gives a shit about his first couple of days where he's eating the fruit uh, yeah. and he's, as he's walking along the path. That In fact, that was a lot of the problem with the Hobbit movie. Movie being stretched into three movies is like no one cares about Bilbo getting his mail. No one gives right, a shit. Even right. <laughs> even hardcore Tolkien fans were like, "Move it along." No one gives a shit. Great, the the dwarves are doing dishes. I don't care. This is a this is a, a dishwasher commercial. Um, so starting in Medius Rest, like they figured that out way long ago in in Greco Roman times that you want to start in the middle of things because just like at a party where you have friends standing 10 feet away and you're go and you hear the essence of a story and they're like, and that's why the car glass was flying everywhere and the door was crushed and the dude's foot. And so you leave your conversation to walk across the room to go, wait, 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 what are you talking about? What is this? Because they are in yeah. the middle of it. They're in the thick and the, in the most exciting part of the story. And that's where you want to start your story is in medias rest, not at the beginning, yeah. like Brad said. Yeah, don't get don't get caught up in linear storytelling. I know it's a little bit of a uh, trope at this point where we see the movie that starts with the guy, you know, falling out of a, you know, getting pushed out of a skyscraper window and he's hurtling towards the ground and we hear the record scratch and he turns to the camera and says, "I I bet you're wondering how I got here." Yes, exactly. Right? That's kind of a trope. A uh, but it's a great that's a great start to a story. I'm I'm in. That sucker works. Yeah. There's a reason that they do it. Right. Yeah. You so, like so, Thor, yeah. Thor Ragnarok, you don't care how he got caught in that cage. Oh, you want to start right no. there because that's where it gets fun. I, I will I, I other than the fact that I just saw Incredibles 2 and I think it's a really strong contender, I think Thor Ragnarok is the best of the Marvel movies. Because I, it had that whimsy in the storytelling. I got to tell you, Thor Ragnarok, with, without, uh, uh, without hesitation, has become my favorite uh, Marvel movie. I think... Hands down. Yeah, I think... Uh, and I agree. Taika, if, I, if I'm pronouncing his name right, Taika, I think, did a, a fantastic job of taking what, to me, was the most bore snore brand of any of the, of the Marvel movies. Like, watch Thor The Dark World or whatever that thing was again. You'll get 10 minutes in and yeah. go like, boh, this is a, a shining piece yeah. of shit. This is terrible. I'm but out. Ragnarok has joy in it. It has fun in it. It has friendship. It has it has a flowing story that bounces along really well. I get that's a beautifully made movie. It's really, really good. Yeah. I And, and I think that uh, you could do better than to model than, I think you could do worse than to model yourself uh, after that kind of storytelling. And and the first lesson you take is is that opening sequence where he's <laughs> caught in chains and and, uh, and and in the middle of a conversation with the uh, fire giant. It's 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 just great storytelling, and it's and it's not necessarily linear. And just you know what? Let's talk about a, let's talk about a comedic punch too. Right as either Thor is talking, or I'm forgetting the <laughs> demon's name, uh, Sar Sardis. What was it? Surter. 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 Is, yeah. is right when either Surter's getting to a good point or Thor's getting to a good point. Right, the tension's building. That balloon is building. <laughs> It's about to pop, but the the script takes that moment to have Thor then slowly spinning around and going, "I'm coming back around again. Just give me a second. Like that is a great example of of delaying that comedic tension uh, or delaying that tension for a comedic punch. That's a, it's a beautiful line to look yeah. Anyway, not to get too far into that, but uh, anyway, where were we? In medias res. Go ahead, Brad. It is worth it is worth talking about that when you when you are stuck. Uh, take, uh, instead of instead of focusing on the fact, oh, I'm brain locked. I'm I, I've got writer's block. I've got this. I've got that. Uh, it, take a minute to consider the fact that maybe your subconscious is trying to give you a little hand and get you away from that straight line and say, okay, this is a th this might be a good place to change the scene. And 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 uh, if nothing else, that exercise of thinking about what's happening elsewhere that's in relationship to your central storyline might lead you to the next step and it's not necessarily changing the scene but it's but but you couldn't have gotten there without going through that exercise of thinking about what's going on someplace else you know what i'm saying well and you know what another reason why i think your suggestion is brilliant is 
Have you ever had it where you're working a problem, you're working a problem, you're working a problem, and nothing's coming, right? You're just like, yes. the, the, you can see the sparks flying from the spinning wheels in your brain and nothing's happening. But you step away for 20 minutes or you go take a shower or you, you plant a flower or you walk a dog or you pick your kids up from school <laughs> or you go make a sandwich. You literally do anything else and suddenly there's the idea, right, or the solution. There it is. And so yep. another reason as I'm thinking about this and why your suggested route is maybe a really good one is because you're basically giving your your brain a couple of days, a couple of weeks off to say, no, explore another storyline for a while. Have fun with that. In the meantime, I'm going to be working on this in the background and I'll check back in with you when, the, when we have a good yep. idea for you. Uh, and I think you are right, Brad. I think, you know what? I'm going to put a little, little check mark right by Brad's name and I'm going to erase the one by my name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I got my magnet back. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot you had done it as magnets. Oh, oh you delightful SOB. All right. <laughs> so, well, if that's if that's the case, Dave, then I've got nothing left to do but to uh, – well, I, 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 I do think we put a little button on that. I think we've uh, talked it right into submission. I think it's sometimes uh, – the, uh, that the best way to work on this is not to get – Hyper focused on it, but to give yourself a little relaxation and, and go and walk another path for a while. I think Do you're right. I think, yep. To to echo your point right there, I think it's a statement to the logical side of your brain is working the problem too yes. hard, and you need to let the emotional take over for a minute. Uh, I think. Very good. I think you're probably right. Well, in that case, I'm going to get out my guitar. Hold on. Ah, there it is. And I'll say that you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been the continuously improving guitarist Brad Geiger, the editor <laughs> of webcomics.com and the cartoonist of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And Dave Kellett, co-director of Stripped and cartoonist of Sheldon at sheldoncomics.com and Drive at drivecomic.com. Com. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission. Don't let Brad's guitar playing fool you. It's used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions at www.woodsong.media. Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash comic lab. But I got to say, Brad, your guitaring is getting better. ha <laughs> ha.